Musically meditated. Musically meditated. Musically meditated. All right. Could you introduce yourself for the listener and uh, what you do for a living and everything that you're involved with, man? All right. Cool. Uh, I'm Julio Guerra. I am an independent comic book artist from Northwest Indiana. Uh, I am also a graphic designer for One Hour Tees in Chicago. And I just, obviously, I taught today. Uh, and so have a previous uh, background with teaching kids art and all the art and music stuff (laughs) (laughs) awesome man uh what did you do today because unfortunately i wasn't able to to catch your your seminar so to speak (laughs) so so what 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 did uh robin ask you to do today Uh, she had me come in and teach kids how to draw so uh we did some uh superhero stuff so we did superman flying uh lego batman and uh iron man helmet which seemed appropriate for the time Awesome, man. And, you know, we've been in contact on social media, uh, tried to have you on the show before, and we will have you on again as a as a as a guest. But Sounds great. Um, as far as art goes, yeah. have you used that as a way to um, express yourself or to release any any problem like any mental health problem, stress, depression, anxiety? Like, it, does it take you there? Does it get you away from your problems? Yeah. So art and music are uh, two big influencers and I want to say stress relievers in my life. Um, I just fell in love with art uh, because I always thought no one can judge you. And it's a faceless uh, medium. You know, you can communicate a bunch of different emotions and let out what you felt in that moment and revisit it and help others who might be in a similar situation you were during that time period. And you don't have to do it face to face, especially for those who deal with like self-confident issues and, um, you know, who are just shy and things of that nature. Um, So that actually helped me break out of my show a little bit more, um, help express my feelings. And, you know, just like anyone else went through a really dark time. And um, that time got darker because art and music weren't around. Like, I gave it up, and when I was told to revisit that by, like, two real close people of mine, like, hey, revisit that, I couldn't be happier, man. You know, um, I want to say six or seven years ago, I got the kick in the butt, like, hey, you need to go do that. You know, the reason why you have this, I don't want to say talent, but gift or anything, yeah, yeah. is to share. And since then, man, I've been nothing but happy. Great. It got you out of your funk. Yeah. Yeah, the way the, to express yourself artistically, mm-hmm. um, literally by drawing art, and then you've always, or from what I have seen, you have a music themed thing as well, oh, where yeah. you draw lead singers yeah, yeah. that have had an impact on you. Yeah. Um, first, well, sec, my first question is: Have you been in a band and experienced anything like that? Yeah, I have. I've okay. been in a, a few bands. Uh, probably the most notable one is Tribal Scar. Um, from North, uh, from East Chicago, Indiana, that was our trademark four six three one two. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we opened up for like Chevelle and oh, cool. stuff like that. So that was a, a big time. And then uh, I jam here and there with other people, but it's not nothing like serious or anything like that. Uh, what instrument did you play? I played guitar, oh. and uh, now I just picked up acoustic bass. Oh, cool. Yeah, cool. So. But back to that, what inspired you or? or- led you in the direction to focus on the lead singer and draw pictures of the lead singer because I remember you would also quote like your favorite lyric. Oh, yeah. And that, I thought that was an awesome, that's an awesome <laughs> idea, dude. It's Thanks. great. Um, same thing, uh, except they're they're more in the forefront, hence why they're called a front man sometimes. Um, they're expressing how they feel and relive, reliving that moment over and over again. And that's courage to me, you know, uh, especially if you're trying to, put out a positive message like Jamie Josta with Hey Breed, like always yes. believe in yourself. You know, you have your family and your friends, you know, um, always honor all those things. Um, and, you know, Jonathan Davis, who went through the child abuse the, yeah, and stuff and like that. Yeah, and just reliving that. And, you know, in the, what is it? I, I don't want to say discriminatory, but the, like, 
slurs that were put to him because he was different listening to Duran Duran and how yeah. they were a little bit more like feminine in yeah. the fashion, but that but, was something he was into and he got called um uh what is it like uh not sexual slurs but like yeah, gay just slander. Gay slander, yeah, yeah, yeah. He caught a lot of slack because yeah. he was a little bit different than the rest of the cool kids in school. Yeah, and then you know, there's positive hip hop too, and everyone like yes. focuses like, oh, it's about you know, degrading women and this like, no, if you really go back to the original hip hop, it was like, uh, well, I quoted run on the thing, whatever yeah. happened to unity. Yeah. You know, and it's things like that. That was like, Hey man, these are positive messages in things that we kind of take for granted. Yeah. But you got to look at the lead singer and the musicians behind that music. Like what, how do you can find or, be together with someone and like hey this is the message we're gonna go and find like therapy through it you know like i'm sure when well if you hear the what is it like the end track of the first corn album you hear him crying, crying after yeah. it that was really heavy and then if you watch the video behind it you see the dudes behind his band crying with him yeah because like, he's reliving those moments yeah so it's just like how do you bring all that together and that that's a ballsy move to me it's it is like, you constantly relive those things, constantly reliving those problems when you go out and perform it, you know, or you rehearse it. It's not always the same because those feelings change. And when you get older, I'm sure he doesn't perform Daddy, or I don't think he ever performed Daddy. I don't know. That's so, a good question. Yeah, but that's a really deep song. Daddy by Corn yeah. is really, really deep. And yeah. And uh, what his wife passed away while they were trying to celebrate the anniversary of Follow the Leader. Oh, I did not know that. And you got to see a different side of him doing Follow the Leader this time. So the mo uh, I think one of the... That's a good point. Um, it was a certain song that his wife loved, and he cried before, and he goes, this was her favorite song on the whole track, and you just see him break down. But because of that love he has for his wife, I think that's the best performance I've seen of that song live. Yeah. You know, so... He could have performed it angry when it first came out and all that, but now because it has a different meaning, meaning. and he's m more mature now, it had a different vibe to it. Absolutely. And I, I like how, how you bring that out, like how the music could change for the artist or for the listener, yeah. you know? So do you have any examples of life, like when you were going through some of your dark times, are there songs that, you know, helped you deal with grief, uh, you know, uh, the death of loved ones, oh, yeah. you know, um, and I think with that too, like that song might remind you of that person and take oh, you yeah. back in a positive way. And then it can give you the confidence to kind of move on and let go, not to forget, yeah. but let go. You know, are there any particular songs oh, or yeah. artists that really do that um, for you? I'm a huge Slipknot guy. Slipknot and Hate Breed are my go-tos. Not saying, you know, I don't like all the other stuff, but those are my go-tos, man. Um, when my grandmother passed away, uh, there was one song I listened to, and it was off Volume 3. It's the last track, and it's called Danger Keep Away. And it was just super mellow. And this is at the time where everybody was, like, kind of giving Slipknot, you know, crap because they went more melodic, and it wasn't <laughs> uh, Iowa where it was, like, just, straight death metal. Yeah, and, and know, dark uh, yeah, and, and aggressive. Where they, where they were maturing as a band and exploring more. Same thing like the Beatles. The Beatles did the just same like, exact Yeah, thing. all the good bands because... Not to cut you off, but oh. Slipknot is the biggest heavy metal band in the world right yeah. now. Like, it's it's very impressive, and it blows me away because I have a Slipknot episode. Everybody go back and check that out. But I was there when they came out in the very beginning, you know, like from the cornfields of Iowa <laughs> at OzFest on the main stage, yeah, yeah. you know, 20 years ago to seeing where they are now. But oh, yeah. I do agree with you going to the third album. Yeah. They switched up their sound. Oh, but yeah. that last song, it did help you deal. Yeah, so, like, I was like, like, as soon as... She passed. That was the first song I heard. And when I hear it now, it's just like, it takes me back to that time. But uh, chapter five, uh, the song's called 19 uh, or X1X. Um, the first thing is this song is not for the living. This song is for the dead. And he's talking about, you know, falling, but he has to get back up and has to continue that. And that was so many years later, and, you know, Paul died. Right. And they Bass wrote player. this in tribute to Paul. They lost Joey. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of depression and things going there, but he still found a positive way to lift himself up, I believe. And, you know, uh, if you know Corey's backstory, yeah. dealing with drugs, going through a divorce and all that other stuff. And when I heard it, I was just like, okay, 
if they can do this and create probably another like kick-ass album with chapter five i can keep going i can keep doing this you know but have it as tribute to my grandmother my grandmother was my biggest supporter with art so like when she passed dude it was dark because i didn't have that you know it's it's a different thing yeah i had my mom and my you know uncle and my dad and stuff like that but you know your huge backbone is gone yeah how do you keep moving forward? So when I heard the song is not for the living, the song's for the dead, I'm like, this is what I got to do. And I keep going. Um, hey, Breed's Last Breath, man. Talk about, you know, remembering that time. This is our last time together, but remembering in a good way. And uh, as diehard as they come, you know, you always have that one family member that you're just like, it's diehard. And I can go to them and all that. So all that reminds me of that stuff, the good, you know, the good times of having my grandmother and then, you know, her passing. But it's like these guys still have this positive message regardless of death and everything like that. And they keep going. You know, what it, What would Paul have thought if Slipknot ended? Right. What if the Beastie Boys ended after MCA? MCA, right. You know, and you if you see the stuff with them now, they're doing the tour where they talk about it. It's in honor of MCA. But all the positive message with the free Tibet movement and stuff Absolutely. like that, that stuff stuff's still going on. And it's powerful. Yeah. But it didn't die with that person. That person still lives on because of these messages and Same. things of that nature. And, uh, you know, I, I like Slipknot as well. But uh, Deftones are like my favorite band, you oh, know, of all yeah. time. And the, I, the same thing could be said with Chi Chang. Remember oh, their bass yeah, player? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, he was involved in that car accident. And then unfortunately, he was, uh, you know, and he was comatose in a comatose state for a few years. And then yeah. he finally passed. But, you know, they kept going on. They got Sergio in to put, you know, to fill in for bass from Quicksand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the last few Deftones, the last three albums since he's been involved i mean the deftones have evolved as a band oh, yeah. you know and they've really found their sound and i'm just so thankful for being such a fan that they kept going yeah you know because i believe chi would want that yeah. you know and you know you watch any old interviews of chi and he was just like the the i, I don't want to say the backbone but he was like the one member that was never taking anything entirely too seriously always smiling you know he has really good uh poetry a good poetry CD. He just seemed like a very mindful, awesome dude. But I think that's a that's a good point. Like how you brought that up about Paul Gray and Slipknot and a lot of these bands that need to keep pushing on, oh, yeah. even though if they lose a member. But there are some bands too to where it's it, it's kind of difficult to do that. Like as a Nirvana, as an example. Oh, yeah. But I mean, you could look at that as a positive too. With with Dave Grohl, he oh, seems yeah. like the nicest guy. Robin shared an awesome story about him, and then Chris has done a lot musically and politically that's been very positive. But there's some members I think that you just can't replace. Oh yeah, you know. And with the front men, like moving on to motivation and mm -hmm. a positive thing with your with your art. Um, are you listening to the particular artist that you are drawing at the moment or the song? Yeah. So um, I revisit why those guys touched my life. Um, and remembering when I first listened to them, how I heard them, things of that nature. And it goes from, man, all kinds of stuff like classic rock to metal, classic hip hop. I don't say country because I only have Johnny Cash on it. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember seeing the one Johnny Cash. Like, I don't always talk about country either, but it's something I don't forget. Yeah. But, yeah, I feel So, um, I mean, there is some really positive country out there, you know, that oh, with yeah. good vibes and, and yeah. stuff like that. Just, you know, it's just not my, my thing. Yeah, I don't listen to it that much either. Um, so, But if one catches, you know, my ear, I'll listen to it. But, um, yeah, just that book was, uh, I want to say, 54 different vocalists from that's what it was everywhere okay. yeah and that was just me going back and listening going oh yeah i remember this and then like you know if you haven't heard a song in years and you're just like either rapping the lyrics or singing the lyrics with it and going yeah you know to that stuff and it takes you back yeah and you're like all flashing back to memories and stuff it's good times man so doing those and um there's of course, Jamie Josta, Haper, and Corey have the most lyrics, uh, and it's from like at least two or three songs from every album from all those guys, from those two guys in particular, because they had the most impact on my life. But like going back and listening to, uh, you know, Johnny Cash, just going through his catalog again of stuff I remember listening to and going, oh yeah, man, Matt, the Men in Black. Damn. Yeah. 
you know it was like that song like made me tear up when i first heard it and when i heard it again drawing it, it made me tear up again and i was like yeah dude like I know why you did your thing. And then, like, shortly after that, I saw that Netflix special of, uh, what was it, The Men in Black versus yeah. Tricky Dick. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, holy cow, it even had more meaning now, like, more than it first did. It was like, yeah, dude, you know, for the people, by the people, and, you know, we should take care of our brothers and sisters Absolutely. and all that. And then seeing this, I'm like, dude, you went against the president. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's Revolutionary. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And it's not talked about. Yeah. And it was like very like you had to be around that time. And like, remember that time Cash went against Nixon, and you know, but yeah, they swept that under the rug big yeah. time. But now it's like, holy cow, dude! Like, you weren't just like saying that for your people. You were saying that as a nation for everybody. Everyone. Like, hey, forget the stereotypes, forget the genres of music. No, we're gonna do this. And then he did the political song. Yeah. Um. What, what is truth? I believe. I think called? that's it. Yeah. And uh, it was like. I'm going to make a bigger stand and go across everything and speak to everyone. Not too many artists want to do that, you know, or not saying they don't want to. They just don't want to take the risks or they don't know how. So I'm like, dude, like cash got even like deeper for me and like reliving all that while drawing that. I was just like, yeah, that's awesome, man. That's like a really, it's just, it's just a cool release, you know, like to combine both both of your passions you yeah. know so i tip my hat to you for sure oh, man. You, man and Appreciate everybody's it. got to check out your art so where where could they find you you know plug yourself social media oh. wise because i know you got gorilla publishing too oh, right yeah, so yeah. It's, uh, so tell us a little bit about gorilla publishing really quick so gorilla publishing so every artist uh every comic book artist wants to work for the big two and big two i mean like marvel and dc um and that's good always shoot high Always, I'm not knocking anyone down. Shoot high, but when you see people who you ins- who inspire you, constantly get the rejection and rejection, and like even Todd McFarlane went on to say he got four. Th- uh, I want to say four four thousand or four hundred rejects until they finally just went okay, and that's really? because he was pestering them. Uh-huh. But he was like, "Hey, you're going to see my art." He was persistent, um, but he kept going. He didn't let one the four hundred shoot him down. And for an artist, man, you're putting, you're basically always just giving someone you so many times. And musically or visual performing, I don't care what kind of art you do. Even this, you know, the podcasting, yeah. you're yeah. giving some someone into your, basically your soul <laughs> all the time. And then just to hear rejection after rejection, you know, that weighs a lot on somebody. Oh, yeah. Um, as, you know, and it, it can lead to, like, depression and all those things. So, like, that one thing that your release is being rejected and by someone you highly regard sucks. So I was seeing two of my my brothers constantly get rejected and rejected. And I was like, man, these guys are amazing. You know, I think they're the, the best thing out of our region. Why are they getting rejected? I know it's a big world and, you know, yeah. big fish, little pond type deal. But, you know, they need to share this stuff. So we saw... Uh, a documentary on Image Comics, which was, you know, Tom McFarlane, yeah. Jim Lee, those big guys. And they were like, you know what? We don't need the big two. We're going to do our own thing. Independent style. Yeah. Do it yourself. And I was like, my buddy Adam, uh, his thing is, why are we competing with one, one another if we're all going for the same thing? How it's can very we punk leverage rock, each other you know, up? Why, you, why, know? Why comp, you know, why have competition when we yeah. could all just, like you said, support one another? And that's, that's where Guerrilla Publishing came from was I was seeing this and I was like, man, why do we need the big two? Right. Why, why do we need their approval? We have stories. We have stuff that connects with people just like any other comic book, any other novel, any other movie, TV show, anything like that. Someone's going to read our stuff, but we can't let rejection keep us from helping someone else connect with our books. Um, so we start Gorilla Publishing. Awesome, man. Yeah, so it had, it's well, very, like, punk behind it. It is punk. <laughs> you know, like you said, like, we're not here to tear each other down. We're here to build one another up. And that, you know, you could look at that uh, in building a brand and in the community. Yeah. Like, we got to, you know, we got to boost each other up. Oh, yeah, and this man. isn't, uh, you know, I call it, the, you know, too many crabs in a barrel. You know, that's from hip-hop, too, you know. You yeah. put a bunch of crabs in the barrel. They don't let the other one get to the top. They keep pulling each other oh, down. Yeah. And why, why make a competition when we could all just 
be in it together. So that's mm-hmm. cool. And I like I like the independent vibe too. Like, hey, mm-hmm. you know, we've been reaching out to the two to the two big wigs and they keep ignoring us. Well, guess what? We're just gonna do it ourselves. Yeah. And that puts no limit on what we can do. Right. You know? So it's like, hey, you wanna tell a story about this social issue right now? You think that needs to be done? Let's do it. Let's do it. You wanna put this story out because you have a love for the old school eighties cartoons and you wanna show that love through this new creation, do it. Um, yeah, no rules. Yeah. So it's just like, let's do it. You know, what's holding us back? Oh, we need money. Let's figure out how we can get money to publish it. Let's figure this out together. Let's get your book out there. And I think right now, this is the time for everyone to do that. Because if you look at pro wrestling, too, yeah, AEW, All Elite Wrestling, was a bunch of guys who either didn't have the machine behind them or worked for the machine. It was like, no, I'm being like stifled down or, you know, held down. And I can't perform or be creative why do we need that machine let's just go out and do it you know so everyone's inspiring everybody somehow yeah. to do is it. like oh he can do it but he's doing art why is there a limit just because he's doing art how come what's stopping you from doing that right. and kevin smith is a big advocator of yeah that, you good know? point good point so right on now um as far as Gorilla Publishing, yeah. plug that. Where could people find that on social oh, media? Oh, so social media, you can go on GorillaPublishingGroup.com. Uh, Facebook, it's Gorilla Publishing Group. Uh, and then uh, I want to say Twitter and Instagram is just Gorilla Pub or Gorilla Publishing. Okay. Yeah. And then yourself, personally, oh, yeah. plug yourself and uh, all your handles and where people can find <laughs> it's you. It's a lot, man. Okay. Uh, so my website is Lagueta, that arcted.com, L-A-G-G-U-E-R-R-A-D-E-A-R-T-E.com. Uh, Instagram is Arctedaguerra, A R T E. D E G U E R R A. Dude, that's a little. I, I need to dumb that down gonna, a little it's bit. It's okay. We'll have all the links. No, but that's good, man. That's good. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Do you um, guys have any more? Any more plugs or links? Um, ooh, um, support your local everything. Okay. Yeah, because without that, man, I mean, we couldn't do like events like this. Exactly. You got nothing but local guys, you right. know, which is really cool. And we all we're all on the same mission, moving up. So cool, man. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. I'll have you on the podcast again in the future. Sounds good. And man. we'll link up. All right, man. Sweet. Thank you. Sir. All right. Thank you. All right. So, could you introduce yourself for the listener, please? Hey, I'm Jennifer Connolly. I live in Northwest Indiana, and I'm a business owner, a coach, and a yoga teacher. Awesome. Where do you uh, where do you teach or coach? I at? teach I teach at the yoga room in Crown Point, and I coach on an international level. So I have coaching clients all over awesome. the world. How long have you been doing yoga for? Yoga. I started ten years ago. Actually, I started teaching 10 years ago. I started yoga when I was pregnant with my second child. I have three children, ages 14, 13, and 10. Congratulations. Thank you. They're very cool people, and they've been doing yoga probably because their mom does yoga since they were little. So um, so I started, when I was preg- started yoga when I was pregnant with my son, and you know, I know part of the discussion today, too, includes mental health. And since I was little, I didn't know the word for it, but I've had anxiety And so when I was pregnant with my second, I realized I wanted a better way to manage my pregnancy, manage my anxiety. I was working at a big job in Chicago and commuting and yoga. I thought, oh, my God, where have you been all my life? And I haven't looked back. So uh, I decided to go through a teacher training program at the yoga room. And now I've been teaching for 10 years. Amazing. And and I specialize in prenatal. um, So I do prenatal. I teach prenatal yoga. And just naturally noticed a love for working with kids and helping them see how yoga could be a resource for them their whole life long. So kind of demystifying yoga for the kids yeah. so that when they're adults, they don't have that thought, well, I can't do yoga. I'm right. not flexible enough for yoga or whatever they, they might Or think. even guys, you know, like yes. a lot of guys are like, that's, that's you know, like sissy or, or you know, that's that's. that's I don't know, girly. Like, yeah, and girl. actually started with guys only. So yeah, it, it you know, was later that but you know, even the, women were able to do is it. That so. the, oh, I did <laughs> not know that. Yeah, but, you but know, you're right. There the are macho, perceptions. Yeah, the perceptions and the machoism about it. And I, I would like to practice more often, but I would say two years ago I was doing it somewhat on a regular basis, and I was awesome. um, doing the vinyasa flow. And I thought mm-hmm. that was such a great workout because it's about an hour to an hour and a half long of you know, you just keep moving and always yeah. going back to that same position. And I felt like, it, like I, whenever I tell like my guy friends, you know, like 
the gym type of guy. Like, hey, it's like running like three miles worth of sweat. Like, I yeah. would just sweat yeah. so much. And that's the cool thing, too, that, that I've certainly discovered, and I consider myself a lifelong learner. I mean, yoga system's more than 5,000 years old, so there's a lot of terrain. But there really are yoga practices to meet you where you are, yoga practices to meet and suit your disposition. So if you need to sweat and you need to move and you need to really feel the energy of, of, of working hard in your practice, there's a practice for you, like the flow that you were sharing. Yeah. If you, you know, perhaps have an injury or, you know, I teach also yoga for Parkinson's disease. So every week I teach that at the hospital and for them to be able to see, okay, I'm not necessarily here to sweat, but I'm here to move. You know, mm -hmm. I'm here to do mindful movement with my breath. I'm here in a chair. You know, yoga doesn't work for me on the ground. And you can just see how beautiful the practice can adapt to whatever your age and stage is. So I, I hope to be doing yoga my very last day of life awesome. um, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, and I think uh, the breath, I like how you touched on that. I was getting into meditation before yoga, and uh -huh. meditation and yoga obviously go hand in hand with the breath, right? Absolutely. And um, I'm thankful for that, but then also, like with musically meditated, I think music is a very meditative way to maybe deal with stress and anxiety or, or move on, so to speak, from something that's haunting you in, in, in your past. And while I have practiced yoga, uh, a few times in the past, or I've had my moments, uh, there was always some sort of music in the background that the yoga instructor was in playing. So do you agree that music has its place oh with my yoga? Goodness. I could talk about this for hours. Uh oh, so let's I have, go. I have a few, I know, right? <laughs> right. You're the coolest. Um, so a couple thoughts. All right. So I used to be in marketing a long time ago, um, said job that I used to commute to Chicago for, but, um, we had a person come in to talk about the impact of music on the brain and how brands use music to influence and brands use music to bring you to a place of nostalgia or what have you. And they, they said something, and I'm not necessarily remembering this perfectly, but how music has a way of bypassing the gatekeeper of the brain that usually chooses whether to allow things in or out, and it immediately penetrates and so that gatekeeper, that critical analytical aspect of us, just says, Let's come go. on in right. to music. And so okay. I really found, gosh, I see the beauty of how to pair music with my teaching and how to pair music with my practice. So an example would be Dr. Lee, L-E-E -E Bartel, B-A-R-T-E-L, did this whole series um, where he studied sound. So he's a neurosur neuroscientist and studied how sounds evoke different feeling states. And so when I teach yoga for Parkinson's, I play a track called Music to Inspire Positive Thinking. And so it's just beautiful melodies, but yeah. there's just something to be said for kind of infusing that sense of positive thinking into the group experience. That's so amazing. I use that. Okay. And then in kids yoga, and when I'm feeling very playful as a teacher for my adults, I play tracks from MC Yogi. I don't know if you've ever heard of I've him. I've heard, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, heard I got to meet him in person. Oh, he, cool. he did um, a concert for Wanderlust when it came through Chicago, and my kids were there, and it was just the coolest thing to get to meet him. But just, I think of him as like, in some ways, Beastie Boys and India and his own personal artistic style come together and create really upbeat, but then also lots of beautiful storytelling of the history of yoga. In yeah. the songs. So. Amazing. Yeah, I love music with yoga. Too. That's my long winded answer to your question. No, though, no, that was a great, <laughs> that's a great answer. And, uh, you know, as far as motivation uh, for the kids and, 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 and with music, is it more of an upbeat to keep their attention? You know, like, so it keeps them motivated and maybe a little bit more interested in doing yoga. Would you say you would play? MC Yogi is, you know, in comparison to like more of a chilled by chiller vibe for maybe older people. I almost like think of myself as a little bit of a yoga DJ. So maybe this, nice. the music that they that the kids, for example, thinking of kids that they might hear at the beginning 
could be some of that more instrumental music to, for happiness. So I have one of Dr. Bartels' is music for happiness, music for positivity. So that might be playing as they're coming into the space. Okay. But then as we play a game or we do something to try to elevate the energy, we'll bring in one of MC Yogi's songs and cool. run around the room and freeze into poses and feel the, the beat and the playfulness. And then there's one of his songs that is my favorite, and I hope you listen to it. Okay. It's called the Chakra Beatbox. And so the seven main energy centers of the bodies have a corresponding bija sound that's associated with it, and it's got a beautiful rhythm. Lam, lam, ram, yam, hum, om. And so the kids love that. So there's a meditative kind of just neat way to see how this impacts the kids and they request it so like as if i'm the yoga dj they request that song because they sing along awesome and you have a little yoga instrument here with you I right do. now i think of it as a companion for sure and what so, is this and could you tell us and give us yeah. a little a little sound sure. okay so this is a tibetan singing bowl and it's made out of brass and pound it out and has a little stick that comes with it with felt at the end. And the Tibetan monks come throughout the U.S. and other countries on something called the Sacred Arts Tour. And they have a little shop, and that's where I got this bowl. So the Tibetan monk held out the different bowls, and as soon as he made this one come alive, so they say you wake the bowl as if the bowl were sleeping, and instead of striking the bowl, you're, you're waking the bowl. And as soon as he played it, I do feel that there's a resonance with sound, yes. almost like a fingerprint, and you yes. just know when that one is for you. And so I, I purchase this bowl from the monks, and I bring it to class. I'm, I'll move around. Sometimes I'll have them sitting quietly and just listening to the power of sound um, as they sit quietly and breathe. And so this, I don't know if I can do it and have the microphone. Can I try yeah, putting try the it. microphone yeah. down for yeah. a second? Already relaxed. I know, right? <laughs> right? So that's making the bowl sing. And so that's okay. how they got the nickname of the singing bowl. That's amazing. Yes, and, I love it. And I like the authenticity behind it too. Me you too. know, and like how you were able to specifically pick that one. Mm -hmm. That one called your name. It did call my name. Right. Uh, moving on to you musically. <laughs> um, every guest that I've had on today, I ask them uh, a live musical performance that you were able to witness that took you away from your problems in your day-to-day -day life. If you could give me three, that's perfect. You know, who, what, where, when, how, and why. Who was the artist? What was the show? What was it about, what was it about the show that just made you forget about everything? Hmm. Awesome question. I'll start with when I was four. Wow. I was born in New Jersey, a huge pride for my New Jersey roots and I got to go to a Juice Newton concert with my family and I remember the red felt chairs in the auditorium and her singing playing with the Queen of Hearts cool. and so that just brought me to this place of like the enchantment of a concert as a little girl um, and then most definitely Coldplay uh, I've seen them multiple times they are just incredible and I feel like another part of my soul like a direct pathway to a soul connection with the band and I wish they were my friends so just in my my imagination <laughs> they're my friends no I agree <laughs> yeah when you really love a band like oh you feel God. like you personally know them I do I really do yeah I do um so most definitely Coldplay and I love I went I went with my best friend then I went another time with my husband and the third time I went I went with my ch two of my children and then the fourth time I went I went with dear friends of mine and it was funny I tried not to go to that concert <laughs> just financially I'm like you know what this I'm just gonna take a pass and one of my co-workers bought me a ticket she said it breaks my heart to think of you not being there at a cold place and show. she sponsored Aww. me that's it nice was, I it was the kindest 
unexpected thing. Oh, that's great. Um, so I just gave you like five. Um, that's yeah. five, yeah. <laughs> Are there any other bands too that you remember? Well, definitely being at MC Yogi with my kids to okay. be able to, my daughter and I, um, getting to be in the presence of someone who I feel like an ambassador for, you know, having brought MC Yogi to my students for all these years to get to be with him. And he signed a balloon for my daughter and he signed my CD and oh, I still have that. And, um, and I did feel both transported and then deeply, deeply connected to a community of people who believe in the same peace thing. and love and light in the world. So Great, great. Well, thank you for spending your time with me. Uh, could you plug your social media and your business and where people can find you? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so I have a little SoundCloud thing called the Mindfulness Minute. So if awesome. you look for the Mindfulness Minute on SoundCloud, my name again is Jennifer Connolly. You'll see my website there. And uh, my company name's Triple W Forum. So there, that's on Instagram as well as myself, Jennifer HGC. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Like Thanks I said, so much, Joe. It's awesome. Thank you. And I, I'll have to check out a few of your classes. Okay, please. I will. Okay. I will. <laughs> I just have like a crazy actual work schedule. Uh, I work shift work and whatever, but I think I might uh, have the opportunity to work like a normal straight day job and have the weekends off. So if that happens, I'll definitely look you up. All right. Sounds wonderful. All right, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. All righty. All right. Well, could you please introduce yourself to the listener? Yes. So my name is Lindsay Wasowski and um, yeah. Do, yeah. Do I go into what I do? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Okay. What, do you, what do you do for a living? Okay. Um, so I teach third grade. Um, I used to teach with Robin Sizemore. Um, so that's how I know Robin Sizemore. Um, but yeah, so I teach third grade. All yes, right, all and right. I've kind of been around the block with that, where I taught first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and now I'm at third again. So, at third again. Yeah. Okay, where do you teach at? I teach at Edison Elementary. Okay. Yeah, so cool. that's kind of right down the street from here. Right now, where did you yeah. go to college? I went to Ball State. All right, that's a good teaching college. Yeah, it is, yeah. And it's a fun college to uh, party. <laughs> it, it is, <laughs> yes. There was, there was a few nights of that, but... Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Um, yeah. How did Robin... Or what should I say? Why did Robin reach out to you specifically yes, to help out so on Superhero it's Training actually, Day? Actually, um, well, I'm going to kind of start how we met because it was okay. kind of a really cool story. Yeah, please. Um, we both started here, actually, where the Superheroes event is being held at. We both started here um, teaching our first year here. Um, and it was kind of our first orientation day. And we kind of met in the teacher's lounge. Um, and we kind of just hit it off. And probably like a month later, she came into my room and kind of broke down i hope she's okay with me saying that but yeah kind of <laughs> so no, let me speak for her yeah, yeah it's totally she, fine. she's okay <laughs> yeah. yeah um and kind of broke down and just kind of shared some personal experiences that she was going through with her daughter um and we just kind of became really good friends kind of from that point um you know i listened to her i could go to her with some of my issues so yeah that's awesome. kind of how that started yeah she did share that i had her on to promote the show oh, so perfect. she shared that okay. story and her daughter was in the studio and everything, so it's okay. Okay, so Del was in there, so she knows. Okay. So did uh, did you guys come up with the idea collectively, or was it more her, or like were there a lot more people behind for this? For the superhero, yeah, for the event. superhero. Yeah. Event. So she had always wanted to do something like this, where you know students who are going through issues, kind of like this. You know, it kind of stemmed from her daughter and how there's not a lot of resources for these kids to kind of express their anger, express their stress, express whatever they need to express. So this kind of, she kind of came up with, you know, well, maybe we can have a room in schools where these kids can go. Um, and then it kind of just snowball affected from that. And then this is kind of how it, it came, came to. Came so, to. Yeah, we kind of just came up with this event and it kind of just. It's amazing. And this is yeah. the second year, right? This is the second year, yes. Okay. Last year it was at Morton High School, um, and then so she was able to have it here this Cool. Year, it's so. a really cool setup. I like yeah. how there's, like, all the different, you know, just yoga to art to right now there's a speech going on with yes. Heather that I had on earlier. Yes. So it's great. Now, moving on to you personally, yeah. um, what do you have any type of hobbies that help you deal with stress, anxiety, depression, all that dark stuff? Um, I do, you know, I tend to work out, um, a lot. So that kind of helps me to kind of just, when I get home from work, kind of de-stress. Um, I work pretty long hours. I teach and then I have to have like second, third, fourth jobs to kind of supplement. Um, so when I get home, you know, it's been like a 12 hour day 
and it's hard to get on that treadmill but once I'm on it I just put my earbuds in and you know th- so that's kind of the music aspect of it too. yeah but then nice segue out, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, right. um yeah so working out really helps me um I love to cook so yeah just kind of the, okay. it's kind of all the time I have yeah I no. home and that's what I do so that's awesome yeah and to digress like in the classroom do you ever use music as a theme to help children learn I absolutely do um I'm always playing music when we're writing um we don't have a lot of downtime when I'm able to play music because it's either we're testing or we're doing something pretty you know rigorous but when we do have that downtime when they're writing I'm always putting on music um and it just relaxes them and it's just kind of a a stress-free environment where they can kind of just write and listen to music and awesome yeah Yeah. um as far as it's been a it's been a theme with Everyone I've talked to today with exercise uh, and, and music playing a role as far as a positive motivation. Yeah. So are there particular, I like to call it gym jams that you go to, like particular artists that you <laughs> you you listen to on the treadmill or if you go to the gym, like what's what's on like your playlist? Heavy metal that gets me going. Is it heavy um, metal? Absolutely not. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, you know what? What's interesting is, and this is funny to say. I probably know every 90s R&B song by heart. Okay. So it's like, <laughs> for some reason, that's what I go to. Is awesome. Like the, the, the good R&B. Yeah. I like 90s R&B. Absolutely. Like yeah. some TLC? Well, yeah. What's your favorite TLC album? Um, I like Crazy Sexy Cool. Well, obviously, that was okay. what I, what, the cassette tape. Come on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually really love all genres of music. Um, I'm really, one of my favorite groups is the Eagles. I mean, I just, I love them. Um, cool. You know, I, I, I listen to everything. You're good. I listen to everything. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The yeah. Eagles. I'm trying to think of some other, like, the, uh, my friends and I, we always talk about the 90s B96 yeah. radio station because yes. it was the best. Absolutely. It really yes. was really good. Like, yes. you know, CNC Music Factory to, yep. I don't know, SWV. Yes. Like, this is turning yes. into a 90s R&B no, and <laughs> discussion, but it's I know, great. I know a lot of them by heart. So it's just, I mean, I it's guess it's not that's sad. Not it's just awesome. Yeah. yeah. That was like a really good era for R&B. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Everything except R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, just, 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 just some water. Um, <laughs> right. Um, no, right. Edit that out. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll exclude we'll him. Um, yeah, I mean, I, even from like my mom, I grew up just listening to, I mean, she, she would like play Keith Sweat and stuff. I love so, Keith like, Sweat. I mean, yeah. I just, I kind of grew up with that genre. I love it. Um, but I listen to everything. I mean, I listen to country. I listen to, yeah. you know, sometimes some hardcore rap. Yeah, there you um, go. The you, stuff now is not it, great. But. It's funny how you mentioned uh, 90s R&B because <laughs> All For One, I swear, has been stuck in my head for like the last two weeks. And I Did don't know why. Did you listen to that recently or Yeah, something? like it popped up somewhere and now I can't yeah. get it out of my head. That's a great song. And then Boys to Men. Yes. I mean, they were amazing. Yes. yes. <laughs> they well, were great back they're then. All, I mean, if you think about all of the artists and all of the songs from the 90s, I mean, it was good music. Good music. Even, yeah. you know, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. I mean, great stuff. Absolutely. Yes. Great stuff. And yeah. then I'm trying to think of another one. Uh, the song was called Freak Me Baby. Remember? Uh, Silk. Um, yep. Silk. Sure was. I, on, my, I, on my iPod <laughs> that I use still right now. Yes. Silk is on yep. there? Oh, right on. please. Please. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's all on there. It's good. Uh, now, now moving on to uh, live music. I've done yes. this with everyone so okay. far. So, give me three live shows that you've gone to sure. that were the best that made you like escape your problems, and you sure. know how you get caught in yeah. the musical moment. Mm-hmm. So, who, yeah. what, where, when, how, and why? If you got well, three, that'd be perfect. I haven't been to a ton of concerts for some reason. I just didn't ever get those opportunities, but. Um, the concerts that I've been to, um, the last concert that I was at, I was amazing, and it was Backstreet Boys and New Kids on the Block. And I know that that sounds very cliche, and it's like, okay, here I we didn't go. know they linked up together. They sure did, and it was at the United Center, and oh, it was amazing because I was a huge New Kids on the Block fan, and just to kind of hear those songs again, um, it, it just it made me happy. Good. So that was a really good, a really good one. That was the last concert I was at, and that was three, four years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I was growing up, I saw the Beach Boys in Chicago in concert. Um, 
I'm like drawing blanks it's of okay. concerts that I've been to because yeah. I haven't been to many, which right is on. But the Backstreet fun. Boys and New Kids was that the was one. That was by far my favorite. Yes, awesome. absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. They uh they just dropped they have record store day now, so they have all these rare releases that they repress or yeah. or whatnot. And the new kids on the block was one of them. It's so great. And when I went to the record stores, nobody bought it. So if you want to go get I it, may have to it's go available. And get it. Why would no one buy that? <laughs> I don't. Just too many cool guys going to the record stores. I guess I don't I know. I need to know why no one bought that. But yeah. yeah, that was one of the best concerts. I mean, it was it was a fun time, and you know everybody was up dancing, and it was just it was a great environment okay. to be in. Cool. So, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem. And, uh, you know, like to Robin, I have to say thanks for including me. You know, this is this has been a fun day. Yeah. And it's it fun to been. learn everybody's musical story and, you know, as far as their passion. Obviously, yes. like teaching is your passion, and that goes a long way. Yeah. So thank you very yeah, much. Of course. Thank you. All right. First and foremost, we have a reoccurring guest here. He's been on the podcast Twice, right? Twice. Yes. Right, and I'm going to call you the infamous KG because yes. that sounds very metal. K- yeah, KG, I, I go by KG Masterpiece jokingly with my <laughs> students. I tell them that is my SoundCloud rapper name, but uh, the, the infamous KG is probably. That's a little bit more metal. Yeah. But he's also known as uh, Keith Goff. That is me. How well, are you doing, my friend? Hi, Joe. Hey, thanks for getting me involved today. Of course. I'm really glad that you came and did all my work for me. <laughs> and I got to go and sit and talk with former students about movies and comic books. So no, it worked I, out really well. I know. I really appreciate you uh, including me and, and linking me up with Robin. And this has been fun, you know, meeting all all these different guests that we had on today. And I think this is perfect to to end it with you. Well, cool. Um, and you are a teacher. I am. And people should go back and listen to who. What was the first episode you were on? I think, was it 17? That sounds right. I think episode 17. So you could go back and listen to that episode a little bit about Keith's uh, past with uh, the Peace Corps, Mm -hmm. right? And and all of that. But now, currently, just moving up to right now, you are an eighth grade... U.S. history teacher. U.S. history teacher in Highland. Yes. How did you link up with Robin? What's you and Robin Sizemore's story, backstory? Yeah, so um, both of her... I, I, taught, I taught both of her uh, children, and um, I just really connected with uh, her oldest, uh, with her oldest child, uh, Delaney, and we talked about books a lot, and music, and um, she kind of jokingly started stalking me, like saying, like, "Oh, you know, you've had such a great impact, and you really helped with a ton," and um, so we kind of like started, you know, uh, uh, just chatting that way, and. Um, reached out and wanted to see if Delaney would be my uh, high school aide, which she was for almost the entire her her four years in high school. Uh, so I got you know I taught her for two years in middle school, and then she was in my classroom for you know almost all of her high school you know experience for like an hour a day. So I you know I saw her for you know quite quite a bit of time, and then I taught her brother, and um, she started uh, this uh, organization um, to try to build in mindfulness meditation uh, to help uh, students manage stress and anxiety and depression and all the heavy stuff that kids go through today that I don't think always gets the uh, the attention that it deserves and she wanted to, to start giving people skills to uh, to manage those things and she asked uh, for me to get involved and help out in some ways and I have uh, helped out where I could cool yeah well, yeah like I said thanks for for including me as far as um hobbies for you personally that help you deal with any stress anxiety or depression that you may experience are there some that you would go to uh that you would like to share with us and i know one of them is music for so sure yeah. we'll go to music but are there anything is there anything besides music yeah i i really love cooking um and like i i, I cook uh like three meals a day usually cool. and you need to teach me some of yeah your ways. I, and I, I it's like definitely kind of like my zone where you know i put in i put on music no surprise of course uh <laughs> and i i just kind of you know really really enjoy coming up with something new i love sharing food with people um i like kind of you know getting positive feedback you know it's it's yeah. a nice way to do something and then to hear people compliment things or ask for your recipe or um so that's something that is is a good way that I've noticed kind of helps me build confidence and just awesome. even something as it seems as uh, uh, 
maybe not as huge as just food, but it's something that binds everyone together. And, it does. It yeah. does. And are you still practicing uh, practicing vegetarian? Yeah, yeah. I'm not a vegan, veg- though? I'm not a vegan, but I, I, I'm i a vegetarian and for just about just under 10 years or so. Okay, great. Yeah. I, if you want vegetarian recipes, I do. hit I'm, me up, people. I'm, I'm going to hit you up specifically. I got time. All right, great. That's perfect. Now, moving on to the music and the way that it helps you out, with stress and anxiety and maybe possible depression. Could you uh, shine a little light on that? And the fact that people going back and listening to our prior episodes, we always had a big emphasis and focused on heavy metal. Yeah. Um, metal in general has brought us together many moons ago, almost 15 years ago, if yeah, you think wow. about it, which is crazy through mutual friends. But um, maybe how does metal help you cope? Because it's an aggressive thing, so people might think like, ah, oh, that might make me freaked out. But, right. Um so I was never a sports guy, and I never got, like, my uh, energy or aggression or frustration out through physically. Uh, I don't really exercise. I don't play or watch sports. Um, so I feel like for a lot of people who aren't into those things, like, music could be an avenue um, to help manage all of those, like, negative emotions or the things that uh, kind of wear us down. So for me, um, music was, like, a way to originally contrast myself to the people who were really into sports. I thought I had to be kind of opposite of that. And then, you know, getting older and maturing, realizing it's not about being opposite of anything. It's just finding your niche. Yeah. Finding your niche, finding um, an identity where you, or or like a a culture where you feel you get to be yourself and you get to, um, you know, share what you value and you get to, uh, listen to artists who who might share the same uh, opinions or beliefs on things, or they might be um, just blasting out some uh, some crazy music that you know gets you going in the pit and allows you to you know get out that that negative energy in a controlled, positive way that that you know looks violent or looks uh, maybe unfamiliar and scary to people who haven't you know been at a intense metal show before right. but is actually a pretty structured uh a, a structured organized chaos yeah yeah that's a perfect way to describe it yeah it is but with metal too um you know i think it it's just a good way to to motivate yourself maybe with the energy behind it in a sense of like for me personally uh exercising and working out yeah and i know that you do have somewhat of a reoccurring theme where you use metal in the classroom as a motivation. Yeah. I, Could you shine a little light on that? So I did uh, previously, I, I had a uh, after school club uh, for students that where we just like met after school once a week and listened to heavy music. And I tried to build their vocabulary and the subgenres and just have them bring in stuff that they like and talk about what they liked and didn't like. Um, I kind of slowly introduced to the year, like to let students know a little bit about me. Cause if you just talk about yourself a ton on the first day, one, it's really self-indulgent and two, like the kids aren't really going to listen. So if, you know, like you get to November and then you kind of drop the fact that you're really into like death metal and the kids are like, <laughs> wait, what? Like, you're in a shirt and tie every day. And yeah. so like th- those sort of things, I think, uh, you know, the longer I've been teaching, I think it's an effective way to kind of build a almost like a brand Mm -hmm. um like for students to see me as a a little differently from their other teachers and to see that i'm not just you know a khaki wearing uh, tie tucked in dress shirt teacher (laughs) exactly which (laughs) sometimes i do have to like button up my jacket if i'm at meyer uh, you know, after yeah. school and I'm like kind of have a really <laughs> offensive or obnoxious metal shirt on yeah. with like open face surgery on yeah. it or something or, <laughs> right. a, you know, some goat devil goat. I'm like, yeah. oh, hello. Yeah. How are yeah. you doing? And like covering up my chest. But uh, <laughs> so I think part of it is um, it's also raising a flag, I think, to go like, hey, if there's anyone else who's into this, like we could talk about it. And um Maybe not everyone has, like we talked before about how in, influential, you know, siblings can be or that, that cool older cousin or the, the guy down the street who turned you on to something. And if someone doesn't have that person, like I, I just love talking to about music. Yeah, 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 to, to talk to, uh, about music with students. And 
um, not to judge what they like, just to listen to hear what they, you know, what they like. And, and this is what I like. Check yeah, it out. Yeah. And I also make fun of myself a lot for it, too. So it, I don't take myself too seriously. Okay. But, I, you know, I just kind of like to set myself apart a little differently, like awesome. just playing some heavy music on class. Sometimes. And just being yourself because that's all right. you can be. Exactly. You know, and it's, it's very genuine. Uh, a, a genuine way to approach education. So I, I tip my hat to you for that. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, now, moving on, I've been doing this all day with all the guests, and you're not prepared for it, but Uh-oh. here we go. Oh, boy. Don't get nervous. Oh. All right. It's going to be a Morrissey quiz, isn't no it? No Morrissey quizzes, but thanks for bring- <laughs> I haven't br- no maybe I, I Maybe I brought up the Smiths once today. But you brought up you brought them up a second, so thank you. Okay. And only other one Deftones reference. I was today. that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Only other one. I only brought up the Deftones and Morrissey once, but not bad. Not yeah. bad for musically meditated, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, three shows. The three best shows you've ever been to. Oh. All right. Who, what, where, when, how, and why? If you can't give me three, just one. But what I want to know is the show that took you out of that mindset of wherever you were and you got lost into the music. Yeah. You forgot about all your problems of stress, anxiety, or whatever the hell was going on at home or yeah. in, in, in life at the time. So what you got for me? Okay, so I'll, like, I think of influential, like, crazy, just, like, put me, like, that next level of existence, right? Uh, this is deep. Yeah. Um, I'm, <laughs> so, uh Shai Halud at the Metro in 2003. Um, it was right about the time I first uh, started listening to them, maybe about a year or so after. Um, they played with, like, The Haunted and Cataclysm and Bleeding Through. So back when, like, metal shows were a little bit more diverse, you know, metalcore yeah. and, like, uh, death, death metal, metal mixing. Death metal a little bit, yeah. Um, and so that was the first time I was not just, like, a spectator at a show, like, watching... Uh, a, a metal band or, or whatever, but to where I felt like the first time I ever got the mic, you know, and got oh, you to, did have yeah, a mic experience. Yeah, yeah. So like I got, you know, I, I felt like I was a part of it. Um, I felt like it was a, a whole new experience for me that I, I didn't have previously. If it was, you know, going to like some mainstream um, alternative rock or, or whatever in the past, like this was like, okay, this is a whole new experience for and me. And it speaks to me. Yeah. And I was actually able to contribute to the show yeah, to be a part of the band. Very almost. formative for me. That was that, that was huge. 2003 at the Metro. Right on. Yeah. What else? What else you got? Um, I would say similar to that, uh, Propagandi, who is my favorite band. Uh, this was 2000 and, geez, I want to say 14. I saw them in 2007. And... 2014 at maybe Concord um, and that was right about the time they kind of they probably unseated Shai Halud as my as my favorite band and that show was just like I couldn't walk the next two or three days I had to teach from my chair the day after because <laughs> I was what you so you're in your 30s were you in your 30s then yeah or no? no um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I would have been 30, yeah. There you uh, go. The Welcome. meme of the guy bent over, like, yeah. you know, when it's like 9 o'clock and the, uh, you know, the headliner hasn't <laughs> gone on yet. <laughs> but that was like a raw release of energy and emotion and and seeing a band for the first time in, you know, what, seven years and it, listening to them the more than anything else. Uh, at the time, um, that was just like a... I just they ripped their set was amazing and for me was just it being able to exert anger and frustration and negativity in a in, in a con- like positive way mm-hmm. that 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 is definitely one of my most memorable shows that's amazing uh now moving on to you as being a teacher yes that is your passion so is music how have you been able to incorporate your personal skills like you know your personality skills and your passions to help kids out to deal with motion like their emotions and maybe some mental health issues yeah um i think like in a creative way yeah uh i i try as much as i can to build in option uh options and choice in the class um for students to use music or art or creative writing as much as possible while i still you know hope to teach 
uh, you know, skills that everyone will have, critical thinking skills, analyzing skills. Um, but to also have a piece where kids can choose what they want, how they want to process information. Um, and most recently, uh, I hosted at uh, Highland Middle School an event called Project Soapbox, which I did not come up with, uh, but it's a free curriculum online. So if you're a teacher, uh, you should check out Project Soapbox, in which two, uh, students gave uh, brief two-minute speeches on issues that are important to them or their communities, uh, so they uh, talked, they gave statistics, they used uh, stories that were maybe personal or things that they uh, had learned about from a family member or elsewhere. Um, they conveyed the importance of that issue, and most importantly, not to say that it was like doom and gloom and hopeless, but they, they, called, they created a call to action. Great. Uh, so the students formulated ways to address uh, teen depression, uh, gun violence in schools, um, drug addiction, human trafficking. So some really heavy stuff for, for heavy. eighth graders uh, to take on. And I think it also speaks to perhaps the fact that schools don't always address those concerns. And schools definitely don't always make education democratic. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a newer experience that, that I've done and a newer uh, a strategy um, but listening to kids, giving them authentic audiences to where they can share their work and research, um, and then most importantly, uh, taking action based off of what they said. I think that is something that uh, we need to do across the board in I schools. I agree with you 100%. To give, the, to give a child or a teenager a chance to have their own platform to speak about maybe something that they're afraid of and not a fan of in their community. So moving on, you know, when we have... Uh, elections and whatnot, they wouldn't be scared to to run as a as a, a trustee or or for mayor, you know, because I think it's it's important to let let the youth know like this is like a, like you said a democrat a democratic um, democracy, yeah. you know, and like everyone has a chance. And they should, should see themselves as a part of the process. Exactly, they should see themselves involved. Um, and like I said, there are, that's not always the case. Like schools are undemocratic and here's the curriculum and you don't get to choose. Uh, so the more that you could build in those things to empower and to uplift, uh, student voices, I think is really, really important. That's amazing. Well, Keith, thanks for getting me involved in this. Thank you, Joe. This has been a great day. I'm really excited. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we will definitely share this with you. So everybody, please subscribe to Musically Meditated Podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, all of that, especially if you're a first time listener, uh, which a lot of you may have or you, you probably are with the amount of guests. So please uh, subscribe to that. Hit that. The thumbs up. It really helps out a lot. Smash that like button. Smash that like button and uh share it and thanks again keith thank you joe all righty i'm musically meditated that's right i'm musically meditated that's right i'm musically meditated